this might be weird to hear, <laughs> but I think one of my uh, favorite spaces anywhere is Eaton Center. I love how when you walk in, there's so much light and I love the feeling that it gives me. But I also, I don't know if it's kind of nostalgia because when I was a teenager, <laughs> that was the space that I knew that if I went to the mall, no one would really bother me, that I, I could actually belong. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright has this great quote. Uh, he said, the mission of an architect is to help people understand how to make life more beautiful. Marianne, what is architecture for in your view? Well, I think following on your comment, I would say architecture is really for people. Mm -hmm. It's to enhance people's lives, it's to help them to build community, it's to give them a foundation for uh, their own self-expression, self-actualization. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in every way, every project has that potential, is really to change lives. Mm -hmm. And this is a feeling, right? It, it's the feeling, but it's also, it's also, it has, I mean, architecture is an art and a science, and it creates a platform you know, as you said to the mall, you were there to really just to be there um, and to sort of see what current trends were, to see other people of your same age group, to see, to kind of to see the world, to experience a, an incredible cross section. I think all, our architecture has great purpose in also in that it creates platforms uh, for people to learn mm -hmm. and people to experience um, their own development. So in the academic, much of the academic work that we do is for, you know, research and for science and for, um, for people's, uh, the enhancement of, of endeavors. Mm. And their lives, right? Uh, Carol, what do you think? Well, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned that it is an art and a science. And um, I think we've all heard that architecture swallows other arts. It's kind of the mother of all arts. And so I think it has the dimensions to not only uh, influence us as individuals, but influence us as a collective. And I think with that comes tremendous responsibility, mm. tremendous responsibility to make sure the spaces we make are inclusive and actually reflect a, a community. Um, and I think that that is part of what we do is not only affirm our relationship with a place, a city, a community, but with each other. Mm. And I think that is the great potential of architecture is to actually impact us on very personal levels. And I love that you mentioned, you said it may sound inappropriate, yeah. that you, the Eaton Center, but that's, that's it. It has to do with how we relate, how we feel personally. And the self really is, it, it, a point of departure to the collective. So, so your personal experiences matter because chances are they're the same as someone else's. And space and how we frame that experience, how we frame nature, how we frame our, our urban environments as well, this is all part of how we see each other in a place and how we see each other as a collective. And architecture has the potential and the responsibility to frame that in an inclusive way. And what about you, Galadia? At its most basic, architecture is an artificial habitat that we create. <laughs> and uh, it mediates between the body and the environment. But because it ha uh, encloses our activities, it also defines them. So uh, architecture creates spaces for gathering and for intersecting between human life and the life systems that surround us. Mm -hmm. It also places value on what kinds of activity we want to see in a space. What do you mean by that? Well, when, when we create a place, uh, that place is meant for a particular kind of activity. So uh, say, for example, if we're meeting in a rectangular room, it becomes kind of uncomfortable to meet in a circle in that room, for example. So I, my, I call my architectural practice always uh, inserting circles into squares. <laughs> so that's what I end up doing because, uh, you know, uh, that circle is, is so meaningful to how we gather. It represents equity. It represents, uh, you know, bringing everything that you can uh, to that circle. And um, that's something that doesn't always fit into many of the environments we've created because those environments sort of are tessellated rectangles. And so, uh, by its nature, architecture reflects the value placed on the type of activity it's meant for. Mm -hmm. It also delineates what's possible to do in that space, what's encouraged and, and feels comfortable in that space. Yeah, Don? Mm -hmm. 
you know, there's been mention of architecture as an art, but it's a very social art. It's an art that if, it, if we do it, if we execute well, we shape community and we make, we support community, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's a lab or a performing arts center or a gallery or um, a classroom or a house. <clears throat> We're really shaping a community space. Mm -hmm. And as I say, if we get it right, it makes the life of that community stronger. Mm -hmm. It supports it in the best way possible. You mentioned the Eaton Center. I mean, it's really community. It's civic community. It's people gathering in the city under light. Mm -hmm. We love to be in natural light, ideally outside, but, but natural light inside. Um, <clears throat> the character of that space, your ability to kind of be, be very much alone in that space or observe social gatherings, decide whether you're going to join mm -hmm. or whether you're going to stick to yourself or whether it's just groups of two or groups of 20. Calibrating those kind of gatherings in the community is what architecture has enormous potential to do. We don't, in many spaces that we build, we don't follow through far enough in making communities better through the configuration of space. But when we get it right, we can really make those communities sing. I think you also have to add that the definition that you've given is, is, is an interior space. And I think that we more and more think about spaces as connecting to the outside. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's Absolutely. for people and it's for, for the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, so you pick eat and center. I think that's very, that could have its own whole show mm -hmm. because that it's, it's, um, it's a space that deprive at the time deprived the street still does in a way. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think when we think of or when I think of architecture, I think about how it can open out, out mm -hmm. to place, how it can ha enhance. Mm -hmm. It's inside out right. and it's outside in. So with that proviso, right. mm -hmm. it's a wonderful image. But it, you have to. An architect always goes back and thinks, what's the bigger question here? What? How does that that particular piece of architecture? How did it redefine the city? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we say every building implies a city. So when you look at any piece of architecture, you have to think, what, how does, how does this yeah. particular building impact the environment in which it is about to mm -hmm. transform? Yeah, Isn't I completely it? agree with that because, you know, you talk about the enclosure of space, um, but the shell of that inflects the exterior space. And so whether that's in an urban context or in, in, in embedded in nature, there is an impact to what we do. Um, and that impact is becoming more and more, we, we're more and more aware of our impact it, when we shape the environment. Um, we cannot now in the, in the climate emergency not think of every, every aspect of what we do as, as having impact to the planet. And so we do that on small scales and at larger scales. And I think the urban environment is one where we, we can see exactly how we shape the corollary space that's right outside the building. And what does that, what is the threshold? It's a really exciting moment to think about the facade and what is the threshold between interior and exterior and how do you navigate that? And how do we, in a way, connect back to that exterior environment. And, um, as architects, um, when you're making these uh, decisions, when you are thinking about the thing that you want to say, I guess it's, uh, it's a great responsibility. Do you feel that responsibility, Nadia? Yes, architecture is a manifestation in the physical realm of what humans believe we're all about. Mm -hmm. So how we think of ourselves in the wider world of other living systems, the cosmos. And so when you're making an architectural space, uh, it's very important, I think, to listen to the people who are going to use that space and uh, do your best to distill what you hear from them into an expression that makes sense for them, that carries the meanings that are they hold most dear. Mm. Uh, I think uh, in the past, architecture felt that it was an object in a field. Uh, so if you look at Beaux-Arts buildings, there's a rusticated, very rough, very high kind of division layer from the street. So we love these architectures because they're very grand. They feel imposing grounded. in a way. Huh? Yeah, sort of like they they recall, you know, uh, principles that came to us from you know the old world and so forth. And so that that sort of pattern 
uh, made sense for a certain era in time. And now, if you look at more uh, contemporary architecture forms, uh, they pay a lot of, ten of attention to edges. So uh, like how permeable the architecture is, like how it reaches out to the out of doors, how it intersects with landscape architecture and design, um, whether life thrives around the edges of the space you've created. Um, and inside, and I think that thriving of diverse life is uh, sort of the what we're focused na on now in architecture. Well, we've talked about how um, art is uh, architecture is art and science. Um, is there a political element to architecture? Oh yeah, huh? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And and but I think the the I think the issue of of as an architect practicing, I think you. I could use the word obligation. You have an obligation to your community, to society, to kind of make place as well as you can, to make it as sit as lightly as possible on the earth environmentally, as much as possible, um, to Carol's point, make the thresholds of accessibility <clears throat> as easy as possible. Um, I mean, uh, a lady has mentioned, you know, the Beaux Arts. I mean, there are many, many kind of eras in architecture with the ability to impose and intimidate mm -hmm. and and exclude. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have an obligation to do now, and we understand better mm -hmm. how to do now, is to include, uh, to be transparent, to be inclusive, to be accessible, to welcome and to kind of demystify particularly institutions, uh, you know, various institutions in society, um, you know, provide, have a kind of intimidation factor that is saying you're excluded. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in a moment where we're trying hard and, and exercising an obligation to overcome those exclusions and an obligation to kind of intensify the opportunities and the experience for people within the building, whether, you know, in the myriad of different uh, mm -hmm. possibilities of space. I, I think it's really values based. You know, even when you talk about something, and I'm sorry to pick on the Eaton Center, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, who drives the values? You know, and when it's driven by commercial values, mm -hmm. That, that can be challenging. So something like running uh, the length of Young Street, but not being able to have entries in directly into the Galleria inside. And that's, that's driven by the values of the commercial values yeah. and the operational values of, of the retail commercial developer. Mm -hmm. You look at institutions, they're driven by the values, um, you know, ed educational values are driven quite differently. And I think one of the most fascinating parts of being an architect is being able to bring value-based value, value -based, uh, arguments to, to your clients and actually being able to have those kinds of debates. And, you know, that's, that's not always possible, but it's, you know, and it's probably a luxury if you get to do that. But I think we're in a, a time where client, the client base is open to these kinds of discussions, mm -hmm. and it really changes the form of our architecture within yeah. the city, within nature. But I think, you know, purpose has become such a big um, opportunity for our architects, the idea that we want to do projects that have purpose. Yeah. And I think it is values based and we, you know, our values have changed dramatically pre-COVID to post-COVID <laughs> through, you know, equity, diversity, inclusion, indigenous ways of knowing, sustainability. We have so many new drivers that we need to think very, very carefully about anything that we do. Mm. And that, you know, we have to be sure that our values, our vision aligns with our values. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would also say that the shifting of culture is, is you know, it's a long historic line. And I think that if we start to look in terms of what you were mentioning, Aladia, about the activities within what we do, that maybe even the language needs to change. I mean, we, do we do buildings that represent those who rule or those who serve, you know? Uh, and so if we start thinking about the social agenda, and you mentioned this, Don, the social responsibility, the social art of how we even approach the purpose of buildings, they, they, they're they there to, to house, they're there to educate, they're even seats of government, they're ultimately buildings of service. And so if the language around how we speak about our work and how we speak to clients about it starts to help change the conversation and architects do have agency mm. to inflect those 
You're agendas. not just taking orders from the client. That's right. right. Yeah. And I think we have a responsibility as well as yeah. some agency to try to to try to change those agendas and 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 to actually frame them in the societal values that we have been observing over time as we make and a lot of us are involved in public buildings um, that that actually reflect those values. And lady, but, when I said it was political, um, <laughs> you were like, oh yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, architecture is the deployment, the strategic deployment of capital. And it's by its nature uh, directed by people who can bring capital to bear. So, <laughs> you know, that that is uh, by, its, by its nature inherently political. So uh, yeah. we, I guess are fortunate to practice in a socialism light uh, market where 30% of the expended funds on built environment come from, uh, you know, governmental sources. So um, it's not just, um, you know, the super rich who are defining what those environments are. We have the, you know, the real honor to work with uh, amazing people like, um, Thunder Woman Healing Lodge and Patty Pettigrew and her whole crew, they are not like the, the privileged uh, capital deployment folk of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also like if you look at, um, and, and they're doing a, a site that has, um, you know, a sweat lodge in the back in this highly urban postage st size site that they have to work with. They're managing to fit like a sweat lodge on a sacred fire there. And it's so inspiring. 20 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. Right? No, that blows everybody's mind, right? So uh, so like being able to work on spaces like that is really dear to my heart. Um, uh, on the other end of the scale, I am I was really generously invited to advise on uh, the, um, well, the most political site in the most political city we've got. So the, the Parliamentary Welcome Center is now opening up Parliament in a new way to the public. Uh, so previously, you kind of had to go through this very, I don't know, awkward method of entering Parliament. They're, they're creating a new uh, welcome approach. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting to see the moves they're making there because they're including elements that have never been included in parliament, like native species in the plantings and like non-formal gardens. <laughs> and like, this is like, woo, super revolutionary because it was very extremely formalized in the past, mm -hmm. um, you know, and mostly exotic species. So it spoke very little about Canada and a lot to do about what Canada used to aspire to be, which is essentially some other place. So like when we talk about Canadians, that's diversity, that's our land, that's us. And our spaces need to reflect who we are in all of our glorious diversity. So I'm so pleased when client groups that you maybe wouldn't ever expect to ask these questions are now asking them. And it's, it's such a treat to work with with clients who see those as key project success factors and we're able to, you know, distill that down into a physical thing. Mm. And Don, we're gonna start. Well, I mean, to get at your question about um, the, the role of politics in architecture, um, it's it's present all the time. And, but to get at that question, I think it's, I, in my view, architects have been very bad listeners for generations. Mm -hmm. they, they impose as much as listen to communities and I think why, why was that before well I think it was it was a, a you know it, it had to do a lot with kind of values in society the issues of power and capital yeah. that a lady was speaking of I mean who controls the resources to make buildings which cost you know uh, hundreds of thousands and millions and tens of millions of dollars I mean where is the capital controlled and 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 who controls that yeah. Um, I think the, the kind of issue of listening is a question of listening to communities. Um, you know, we're doing a very large uh, housing project in Ottawa, uh, entirely affordable housing, uh, 500 units of housing, um, and meeting with the community um, and understanding the residents who are, you know, currently um, part of the of. Uh, affordable housing communities in Ottawa, understanding their priorities has led to um, an issue of making all of that to passive house standard. Passive house standard means basically wearing a kind of big, comfortable, warm coat. So it performs extremely well uh, in terms of energy consumption. It's, it's uh, um, 
um, a very a, a kind of respectable standard of environmentalism that was important to the residents. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, how does the lobby work? Where do children, how do children uh, find secure places to play? Um, how do, you know, how do laundries and how do social spaces um, connect with lobbies? What's possible in terms of interaction? All of those issues of making that kind of housing community come out of listening. And I think um, listening and, and understanding and being thoughtful about those opportunities and then bringing those values to the design and using a kind of rigorous process of interaction with your client mm -hmm. or the client's community to kind of understand, are you actually delivering the values that they have talked about? is, I think, a uh, critical aspect of practice now. We're going to talk more about yeah, that on, today, on tomorrow's show on how you plan and how, you, how we build things. Okay. Um, I'm always interested in why people do the things that they do, because um, I think it speaks uh, to maybe who they are and what uh, their role in the discipline that they uh, participate in. So I'm curious to know, what are the reasons you wanted to build something? Uh, Marianne, I'll start with you. What are, what are the reasons I wanted to be an architect? Why you, what you, uh, that made you want to build something? Huh. Well, it's, you know, it's kind of thrilling to hear uh, a client speak about an ambition. Mm -hmm. And I think all of our architecture has the opportunity to support ambition and vision from a client, from an institution. You know, we went through a cultural renaissance of 10 years ago maybe 11 or 12 years ago, where m many clients in our, in our performing arts uh, institutions saw the opportunity to enhance each of their institutions. And so each of them had a vision from the Opera House to the Royal Conservatory, the Gardner Museum, uh, Soul Paper Theatre, Toronto International Film Festival. You, there, were, there were 10 of them. So the exciting part was to hear those, those individuals. And I guess it's you know, it, to me, it wasn't really politically driven. The opportunities were given by the government that they put on the table 400 million, which was, you know, only a billion dollars short of what it was going to cost. But they put this uh, chunk of money because they saw the opportunity to en enhance each of those um, institutions. And so each one had a vision. National Ballet School, well, how could they, how could they expand? How could the offering become more? How could they make sure that the children that went through there had great educations? Because not everybody's going to end up on the stage of the, of the International Ballet Company. So I think listening to those visions um, is, is inspiring. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it also brings out the, the ability, I think, as architects to actually be creative to listen, but also to bring creative responses to the issues that are put on the table and think about how do we do things differently. And it is values when you talk about a rusticated base on a heritage building. You know, that was about values of, a, of another, as you say, another era and another place. And I think we bring a different kind of values. I think the world has changed so dramatically in the three to five years that, that I've been practicing at, at every level that it's made us change our practice as well. Mm -hmm. It's the same values, but such an enhancement that actually does tie to community. Eladia, you once described how architecture should also be regenerative. What mm -hmm. did you mean by that? Up until recently, architecture has been understood as the building, uh, and then all the other things that aren't the building. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're moving into a, into a time of, of thinking about how we shape our environments that also includes uh, other life systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we create spaces, we're not just creating them for humans, we're creating them for all those other creatures, the plant life, the animal life, uh, the, you know, the entities of the air, um, you know, water. Uh, we're creating places where life can thrive in uh, all you know, life. All life mm -hmm. can thrive. And we need to do that because we have discovered uh, recently, I mean, scientists have been trying to tell us this and indigenous peoples have been trying to tell us this for probably <laughs> decades, possibly hundreds of years, that when you do that, you create systems that are not resilient. So in order to create resilient systems that are sustainable and can continue uh, life on this planet, human life on this planet for the next you know, 100 years, uh, we've got to make spaces that are for everyone, uh, for all living creatures, and um, that honor 
uh, the fact that humans are one of the most dependent species on this planet. We depend on everything else for our life. Uh, and if you think about the air we breathe, um, you know, that depends on plants making the oxygen for us and absorbing our carbon dioxide. And so uh, if we're creating environments that are solely for human life, we won't survive. So we really have to change our thinking from um, a dual a duality between mm -hmm. human life and everything else to uh, thinking that, that we are part of a family and that we have a kinship relationship with other creatures. Uh, and we have to honor those relationships um, more concretely, more, <laughs> more architecturally. And the earth. Yeah. And the earth. Yeah. Yeah, because we're one organism, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're one continuous living creature, even though we feel like individuals and we have, you know, our own little dance that we're doing. We really are part of one organism and we have to honor all of the parts uh, when we create space. Uh, we've touched a little bit um, throughout the conversation about accessibility and uh, spaces being for everybody. But if you live in the city of Toronto and you've tried to use a subway, and if you are right. uh, if you are in a wheelchair or maybe you're um, a parent with a stroller, it's not. It's kind of shocking that only a few years ago, um, most of the subways did not have elevators. And even now, if the elevators work, that's a great day. Sometimes. They don't work. Or if you go down to Union Station, the way that um, they've designed the platforms, if you're visually impaired, not made for you. Hospitals, they might have sensors that you need to wave in order for you mm -hmm. to walk through them. And if you're visually impaired, mm -hmm. how do you, you know? Um, so what is the difference between good architecture and good urban planning? I'm going to give it to you, Carol, and mm -hmm. we've got like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, good urban planning uh, creates, a, 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 first of all, an identity for, for a place. Uh, and this notion of accessibility is, is one where we're changing the conversation to say that we're going to accommodate the, these few issues, but to uh, start to understand that accept, making designs, cities, sidewalks, uh, uh, buildings more accessible actually makes them more accessible and better for everyone. So rather than, rather than sort of just creating exceptions to make a, a tolerance for a situation, when we design, it's like when we design buildings for a collective, if we also design for the individual in mind, then we've made it successful for everybody. And so once we make cities accessible for, uh, and, and buildings accessible for those who have mobility issues, or, or, or uh, then, then we've actually made it better for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to shift that conversation to understand how we create that generosity in, in, in buildings that we create. But when you talk about the public realm and when you talk about city planning, I think part of that is actually putting a priority on the public spaces and public realms. And part of this is the fact that we have commodified uh, architecture to such a degree mm -hmm. that we talk about the square footage of, of, of houses, we talk about the square footage of a, a living unit, but the corollary social spaces that are required to make those communities successful are not necessarily given value or mm -hmm. priority. And so successful urban planning sees value in the public realm, sees p value in the space adjacent to the community that you've built, and sees those that as an occasion to actually create value in our collective public experience. And so I, for me, su successful urban planning goes beyond these issues of accessibility, but how we on a daily basis encounter each other in the public realm and how we create a sense of genius loci or sense of place that is really inherent and specific to the places we're building in. That's building a sense of community. And urban planning has that huge responsibility as well, beyond issues of transportation and, and all the other components that go into urban planning. Uh, I think that's a great place to leave it because it will help us uh, for next our next segment to understand more about the building blocks of architecture and whether uh, form or function is more important. Thank you so much. I've already learned so, so much already in this last half hour. Appreciate it. Our guests all this week are Eladia Smoke, Gay Shigaba Week, Principal Architect of Smoke Architecture. Carol Phillips, Design Leader and Partner at Moriyama Tashima Architects. 
Marianne McKenna, founding partner of KPMB Architects, and Don Schmidt, principal of Diamond Schmidt Architects. The agenda in the summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.